Welcome to a science live chat on Selling America's Fossil. Today I'm chatting with Thomas Carr. Thomas is from Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and he studies tyrannosaurid dinosaurs, everybody's favorite dinosaurs, T Rex. And we also have Peter Larson. And Peter is a candidate in vertebrate paleontology at the University of Manchester, and he's also founder and president of the Black Hills Institute, which is a for profit. Um, geological and earth science supply house. So thank you both so much for making yourselves available today. And I want to apologize to you and to any of our viewers who came in yesterday. We had some technical difficulties, but we're very much looking forward to our chat today. And I want to remind all our viewers that they can ask questions by posting in the comments section at the bottom of the page here. We have some great questions to start with, and uh, please add to them because uh, this is a live chat. So if you post your questions, we can have our experts answer them. So we're talking today about selling fossils, in particular selling fossils from the United States of America. And so let's hear a little bit about this industry. Maybe, Peter, you could tell us a little bit about the commercial fossil industry. When did it start? Do you think it's a growing industry in the United States? Um, the fo selling fossils actually began before people were studying fossils. Fossils have been curiosities that people have been picking up for thousands of years. And uh, they're very interested in it because they look like, sort of like living things, but they're 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 what people look at as 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 rocks. And so this has been going on for a long, long time. We've had a very very nice relationship between people who collect and sell fossils in museums. Many of the specimens you see in museums today were collected mm -hmm. by people like Sternberg and Hatcher and and Mary Anning. Uh, sh she sells seashells by the seashore, uh, in uh, in England. Uh, also, these people were highly recognized in the scientific community for their contributions, and so it's something that's been happening forever. It's, it's part been part of paleontology forever, okay. and and it still continues today. The, many of the new exhibits that uh, go up in museums uh, rely upon uh, commercial people like the Black Hills Institute to to fill their museums with stuff. And so, uh, let me just ask something here, Thomas, which is that the Society of the Vertebrate Paleontology actually does not condone the sale of a scientifically important vertebrate fossil unless it's to a museum. So tell me why, walk us through why the Vertebrate Paleontology Society is hesitant about this fossil sale business. Right, so let's just back up a second just to the main question of, of this chat, and that is the question, should dinosaurs be sold on the open market today? And the answer in my mind is unequivocally no, and that's not because I'm grumpy. I've had my morning coffee. <laughs> See, the bottom line here is that fossils are our only window onto past life. And fossils contain a lot of information that, that benefits science and the quality of public education. So to ensure that happens, in 1940, paleontologists founded the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, or SVP for short, and since then, the SVP has grown to have over 2,000 members, including Pete and myself, and other professors, students, and the interested public. And each year, we meet up to share our research and talks and on posters. It's a lot of fun, and it's a great learning experience for students. Now, the SVP is there because fossils are cool, and they contain information. And to guarantee that the information makes it out to researchers and the public, the SVP has agreed on a couple of points in their code of ethics. And the first is that if fossils are to be sold, they only go to a legitimate museum, university, or college collection, not to a private person's living room so the public can see the fossils and scientists can do research. So a fossil can't be sold into someone's living room because only one person can see it. The second part that's been agreed on is that us scientists can only report on fossils that are in a public collection so that others can check to see that our work's correct. Makes sense, right? So as members of SVP, Pete and I cannot agree with the sale of dinosaurs on the open market to a private collector. So let me just read that section, if that's OK. Sure, um, go ahead, Peter. Section 6, the commercial sale or trade. The barter, sale, or purchase of scientifically significant vertebrate fossils is not condoned doesn't say condemned, says not condoned, unless it brings them into or keeps them within a public trust. Any trade or commercial or commerce in scientifically significant vertebrate fossils 
is inconsistent with the foregoing and that in that it deprives both the public and professionals of important specimens which are part of our natural heritage. So what I maintain is commercial people strive to do the same thing that vertebrate paleontologists do. We have, for instance, Black Hills Instant has, Institute has collected about 10 T-Rex specimens, four of which are mounted in museums uh, in the United States. We have mounted and, and sold 10 duckbill, uh, Montosaurus nectins, duckbill dinosaur skeletons, two mounted triceratops skeletons. These are on display for everybody to see and for scientists to work on them. Uh, the other thing to remember is not all fossils are scientifically significant to every scientist. There are literally millions of fossils destroyed each year by the agents of weathering. And there was a really, really interesting uh, uh, program on uh, Science Friday a week ago with Ira Flato and a fellow by the name of Max Tegmark pointed out that he's, he's talking about the, uh, the, uh, the, the universe is 13 billion plus years old, but 47% of adults in this, in this country, in, in the United States, believe that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. Uh, college graduates, 24% of all college graduates think that the, uh, the humans and the animals that exist today have not changed through the time. They do not believe in evolution. Isn't it an important thing to take some of these multiple fossils that nobody has an interest in, get them into the hands of school kids, get them into the hands of, of uh, uh, school teachers, get them into the hands, put, put them on a mantle place where somebody says, wow, here's something that's, 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 that's uh, uh, 65 million years old. And you can see it. It's not like life today. It's different. <laughs> It's important to spread that out so that people understand. I mean, we're doing science a disservice if we do not educate people on evolution and, and the age of the Earth and the age of the universe and understanding how life changes through time and get rid of some of this mystic stuff that, that it pervades society. So you think that it's okay to sell vertebrate fossils, dinosaur fossils, for, say, someone's living room, although I suppose you can put a dinosaur in a living room, but still, you think it's okay to, to do that? I absolutely do. It, it serves a purpose too. Um, certainly, the scientifically significant ones, uh, the dueling dinosaurs. We tried for that. That was for uh, since 2006 that we tried to go to museums, tried to help the finders and the, the landowners to get the dueling me, dinosaurs into a museum. Let me back up just a minute and explain what the dueling dinosaurs are. Oh, sorry. Sure, of course. The dueling dinosaurs. There was an auction last November in New York City, and there was a number of. Uh, natural history and vertebrate specimens up for sale, and one of them was a specimen called the dueling dinosaurs. It was a single specimen, and inside it were uh, two dinosaurs, two dinosaurs. One was a small tyrannosaurus, and one was a larger, what was the other one? Who, who uh, knows what the other one was? Probably, probably a, a very, very old triceratops. Okay, but, but a triceratops. skeletons. Okay, so they were complete skeletons, and there was thought that these might be scientifically significant because there's been some question about some of these small tyrannosaurs and whether or not they are a separate species or not. So there was a feeling that this really could be a scientifically significant specimen. So anyway, these, this specimen went up for sale, and uh, it did not sell, in part because the people who were selling it did not get their asking price. Um, so it did not sell. It, they had thought it might sell for several million dollars, five, up to 5.5 million, but it did not sell. Okay, so I'm sorry, Peter. What were, you, what were you wanting to say? You had been working on that specimen, is that right? Yes, you and <laughs> Thomas and I both, both. This, this is something that is right exactly in our line of research. This is a really scientifically important specimen. The specimen was collected in 2006. It has been offered to museums several times. We got involved in, I think, 2010, trying to get it into a museum, and there were museum, museums interest, were interested in it. We went all the way to through negotiations <laughs> with the museum. And and it, it, it didn't it, it ended up for whatever reason uh, the economy whatever and so the owners uh, not my decision but this is the, this private property they, the owners decided well one way to get it into museum is the same way they did with Sue uh, the federal government put Sue up for for auction to the highest bidder uh, and 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 so it was one possible way of doing it it didn't work unfortunately and it still remains unsold. Although I must say that there's a, there's a, a really good chance now there's uh, a couple museums who are very very interested in it so um, uh, we're all keeping our fingers crossed because both Tom and I want to study this you know um, we've taken some precautions we've scanned the specimen we've made casts of parts of the specimens and have have integrated those into our collection but but the real specimen is so important the it's 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 uh, nobody's going to disagree that this specimen needs to be in a museum including the owners. 
Okay. Tom, you know, I, do you have anything? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I do. I, I think that Dueling Dinosaurs address the issue on the website. There's one of the questions is, what impact does the legal fossil trade have on science? And I'd extend that to public education as well. See, when fossils are sold into a private collection, only one person can see it. Scientists can't study it, the public can't see it, and public education just doesn't benefit. So arguably, the legal fossil trade has brought us to a, a crisis point where important fossils are viewed as commodities, such as the dueling dinosaurs. And the dueling dinosaurs, I think, are an example of the despairing state our science is in. Now, I really hope the dueling dinosaurs make it into a museum, and I know that Pete agrees with that. But even in the best case scenario, where they do wind up in a museum, because dinosaurs are viewed as commodities, commercial collectors can put a price tag on them and ask for, say, $7 million. Now, I've asked my colleagues at big museums about the cost of their field programs, and they tell me that they can stretch a $1 million uh, to fund at least a decade of field work collecting dinosaurs. So with the dueling dinosaurs, a museum is forced to choose between one specimen or over 70 years of fieldwork research. So the impact of the legal fossil trade has a huge negative effect on the science and education when, the money, when all that money is blown in one shot on one big ticket item instead of funding research. So and you're saying... When you, oh, go ahead. So, let me just, so you're saying that museums, and many museums of course are not flush with funds right now, but right. that the way the fossil trade works is that museums are forced to spend their budget buying high ticket fossils instead of doing additional scientific research that could yield many specimens over many years. Right. I mean, you know, when the dueling dinosaurs were being shopped around, it's come out that uh, the fossils were on offer for $15 million. So and no museum could afford that. It, it, excuse me, museums... Hey, yes, go ahead. Museums have the capacity to raise funds. Uh, paintings, paintings made in this in this uh, last 50 years have sold for more than 100 million dollars. Uh, it, it it is up to the museums to get their their donors, their their the people who support the museum to support purchase of some of these fossils to get them in the right place. It is a it is a duty that the SVP says they should do. They want to put them. They, they it should be put in, in into museums and and uh, uh, to to. Things like Sue, look at what it did to the Field Museum. It brought in tons and tons of visitors. They spent $8.36 million on the purchase, and they spent, uh, uh, allegedly, or someone has told me, a total of $20 million getting this, this dinosaur on exhibit. Sue is unique. The dueling dinosaurs are unique. You, will, you could look for a million years and not find something like the dueling dinosaurs. So a field season is not going to produce something like that. It's, it, and all the time we've, we have uh, uh, collected dinosaurs in North America. No one has ever found a complete skeleton of what Tom calls a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex and what I call Nanotyrannus. No one's ever found one until now. And it was so, found on private land, private land where they, they, the private landowners uh, 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 may or may not have allowed universities in to, to, to prospect, but those private landowners, the ranchers and, and agriculture in this country is, is, is in a crisis. They need to survive. Here's something that Yes, if it brings in money to the ranch, it can be a cash crop. But that's a good thing because that ranch will be able to survive instead of being bought up by some big corporate corporation that's going to do uh, corporate farming and corporate ranching. You know, we need to have small family farmers and small family ranchers, and that's this is one way that they can stay in the business. And you can't blame them; it's their private property. So you're, you're you point out that this obviously would help the private landowners, um, although. Some museums are in financial crisis too, so obviously it's a hardship for them. Let me ask, let me talk a little bit about this public-private divide here, just because, to make sure everybody understands, if you collect a fossil, if, if a fossil is found on private land, the private landowner can do whatever they like with it, correct? But if it's found on public land, something else happens. So, Thomas, right. why don't you talk to us about that? Well, I'd, I'd like to sort of focus in on, on the question. Um, that this falls under the umbrella of, and that is, should commercial collectors be permitted to sell important fossils? And as we know, if important fossils are to be sold, then they must be sold ethically so the fossils go into a legitimate museum collection. I mean, everyone, want, everyone wants to see that, right? 
Now, if landowners find a fossil on their private land, they have other options than to go to a private to a commercial collector. They can, for example, they can go to their local nonprofit museum, university, or college and offer the fossils a tax deductible donation that could be worked out in the landowner's favor. Um, it could even be variable depending on the type of year that they're having. Just picture it, an important dinosaur in a local museum with the family name on the plaque is a significant family legacy that's a contribution to the entire community. And the fossil will attract tourists who are good for the community's economy. So there's a lot for a landowner to gain when they're benefactors of a museum. So commercial collectors aren't the only option landowners have. And I, and I know, pardon me, many landowners uh, value local history, heritage, and public education. And landowners lose that opportunity when a commercial collector sells their fossil to a private collector. So, so Tom, can I ask you a question? How, how would you feel if I thought your house is really, really important? It's got historical significance, and I want your house. I need you to donate that house to the local, uh, 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 the local museum. You need to donate your house. How would you feel about that? Oh, I said uh, a tax deductible donation so that there's some benefit that goes back to the, the landowner. I mean, that just makes sense. So, that you're, you're, around. so, so you're willing to donate a $100,000 house. I'm talking about your house now, not the landowner. I thought your, we were talking about dinosaur fossils. Well, but yeah, let's go back to dinosaur fossils. something that's private own, privately owned is what we're talking about. It's, it's, it's not... You know, you can have you can have some ethics that vary from my ethics, that vary from other people's ethics. But that we are in a capitalistic society here. We have private ownership of land, and and you have to, uh, you know, we just have to deal with that. You know, we're, we don't live in a communist society. We live in a we live in we live in a capitalistic society. All so I'm what saying, you're saying is that that people have a choice with what they do with the fossils on their private land. Oh, of course they so do, and but it's their choice. choice. And so what you're saying, Pete, is that in our system, you can, in, in the American tradition of free enterprise and private property rights, uh, private landowners have the choice to sell their fossils to a commercial collector. And Thomas, you're saying that you wish that uh, perhaps that some of these landowners would also consider other options. Yes. What I just want to mention a little bit is public land, because public land, the situation is different. Is that correct? On public land, as I understand it, um, you have to... To, if, if fossils are collected on public land, which after all belongs to every citizen of the U.S., yes. those fossils must go to a um, public trust of some kind, a museum yes. or public trust of some kind. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, I collect on BLM lands, Bureau of Land Management lands, and each year I submit a field report and a permit application for permission to continue my field research on BLM lands and um, and the museum where I'm a uh, scientific advisor the Dinosaur Discovery Museum is designated as a federal repository so that those fossils will be held in perpetuity under our care and in the meantime I have students uh, who are trained on fossil preparation so there's educational and also research benefits that just go beyond uh, the collection. It's actually a living collection and it's used to the benefit of education. And so that arrangement guarantees that that actually happens. And, and so Peter, so, do you have a has, comment? Yes, I do. Um, uh, and, and, you know, nobody's disagreeing with that. The problem is, or one, sorry, not the problem, what one should realize is that some states, for instance Nevada, is 90 percent public land. States like Montana are over 60 percent public lands. Um, South Dakota is, 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 I don't know, something like 40%. Though there's lots of public land out there that scientists have complete access to. No one else does now. Uh, it's only the scientists. If you have a Boy Scout group mm -hmm. wants to go out and collect, uh, collect uh, Oriodon teeth or something like that on, on BLM land or, or grasslands, they can't do it. They'll go to pr prison for it. Um, you know, the pri having the private land set aside for, as private land is also a good thing, and and we can coexist together. There's no, you know, the uh, there's no reason why all the land should be tied up for science. There's also things like Boy Scouts, things like uh, Scouts, sorry, things like 
things like uh, rock collectors and people who just have an interest in it. People who find it, actually the ones who, the amateurs are the ones who find almost all of the, the, the very, very significant museum display specimens. Uh, of, of all of the T-Rexes that have been found, only one uh, significant skeleton, only one was collected by by a vertebrate paleontologist was found by a vertebrate paleontologist. They were all collected by people who study vertebrate paleontology. But those amateurs, just like in astronomy, are a super important part of paleontology. And and some of them do it for for absolute free. Most of them do. But once in a while, some of them would like to have some of their gas paid for and some of this sort of thing. And and it's 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 perfectly legal. It's it's it, it is a help to paleontology as well because it makes specimens available that otherwise would not. Uh, Tom has uh, has. Um, espoused the idea that eminent domain should be used to condemn fossils on private land. Uh, that's not going to open any doors with private landowners to Tom, uh, and and it's it's not going to uh, if you found if 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 those were if it's going to cost the landowner money to have somebody come in and collect the fossils and leave the gates open and let their cattle get out and stuff like that, they're not going to want to cooperate. Uh, so let the landowners, you know, they should they should, they have rights too. Tom, do you want to talk about your eminent domain idea? Um, actually, I'd like to first describe sort of the, the conditions that the science is in right now. And it comes back to the primary issue, and that's the question, should dinosaurs be sold on the open market? And that implies that dinosaur fossils are commodities and are viewed that way. And, and certainly that has happened. And Sue was a threshold event. Um, this is what's happened since. The current state of affairs is that not just in, in the United States, but also around the world, dinosaur fossils are being poached for the illicit trade in vertebrate fossils. There's been a steady stream of poached uh, skulls, dinosaur skulls from Mongolia, eggs from China, and they're all illicit. And these things wind up in public auctions where they sell for tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. In the American West, uh, even in the area where I collect, um, we see evidence of poaching of fossils. And what are they poaching for? They're poaching for money. And on, if you can go on eBay and see that you know, a fairly large T-Rex tooth can sell for as much as $6,000, the same thing can sell for as much as $30,000 in a, in, a, in a public auction. So basically, the science is being hit on all sides in terms of the very specimens that it depends on to study. And that's the, you know, that's the crisis that we're experiencing. And I do think that the commercial trade, the legal one, sends the wrong message and does give people incentive to, say, poach fossils, um, you know, smuggle them out of their native countries for sale in other, you know, in other countries. So we have a climate that accepts the commercial trade, and it is simply out of control. I mean, I've seen poaching on my BLM, in my PLM area. It's I just see. out of control. So no one, no one condones, no no one who has an interest in science, no one who loves fossils condones that. That's illegal, it's wrong, and, and we're all against it. Everybody, everybody, everybody that is is for the same things that Tom and I are for. We we, we do not condone this, uh, this the, the, the illicit collecting. Um, one thing to note, Mongolia, it's the, the government owns all the fossils. The government, there are no legal ways to go out and collect fossils on any land out there except for the Mongolian government and permits. And look what happened. Look what happens. It, it didn't help. It did not help. The, 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 it, it got to a point where they've just destroyed, destroyed specimens, taking the skulls off of skeletons and things like that. China's a little bit different. China, it is legal for people to collect fossils in China. And the government actually buys the important fossils for the government museums. But in China, it's illegal to export the fossils from the country. And that has also led to the illegal exporting and, and, and smuggling, which none of us condone as, uh, either. But, but it's, they're, they're two very different situations. So you're pointing out that, there are, that different countries have different ways of dealing with this. For example, in Canada, in the province of Alberta, every fossil that you find, even if it's on private land, my understanding is it belongs actually to the government. Yes. Um, so that different governments in different parts of the world have found different ways of dealing with this. I want to ask a question that, that one of our um, chat participants had asked that, that we've touched on several times, which is 
what makes a fossil scientifically significant? In other words, what, what makes a fossil important to science? Do you want to tackle that one first, Tom? Yeah, um, well, um, there's sort of a, a list of things, and you know, we can look to the list of paleontological so societies have to assess the value of fossils, uh, particularly of dinosaurs and other backboned animals. This can include uh, the presence of skull bones or a complete skull and skeleton, um, a bone bed where there's you know, a whole bunch of sort of disarticulated bones in, in a particular place. The bottom line is that all science, including paleontology, depends on data, and that is information. And that information is tied to the specimens, and when excellent specimens are sold to private individuals, science loses it. And if we think about it, it's analogous to, say, Alzheimer's, where very slowly and incrementally the memory of the Earth is being slowly lost. So I think the, the fossil trade, whether it's in le you know, legal or not, we're losing that information, which is the foundation of the science. So one of our, our chat participants said just, that they felt that, I'm going to get to you in just one second, I'm going to ask someone, okay, don't worry, you have your chance, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, they said that they felt that depending on the question you ask, almost any specimen could be scientifically significant because you want to, you know, you might need, I don't know, 10, 10 tyrannosaur leg bones or something like that, or maybe you want yes. 20 of them or something like that. So yes. that would mean that almost any good specimen could become scientifically significant. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I certainly do. And in my own research, I've encountered that where it's been, it's been very important for me to have, say, a collection of isolated teeth. Those might be really important or just toe bones, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, the bottom line is every fossil is scientifically important. Um, now, there are ways of uh, sort of separating out um, specimens like that, plus in contrast to fossils that are truly abundant. So for example, in Alberta, they have something called a control list. And on that list are fossils that the scientific community has deemed acceptable for the public to collect. And that would include things like fossil wood, fossil shells, things that are truly numerically abundant. And we have to remember that we have a very small sliver of the entire diversity that actually existed. So things like plants and fossil shells are, are truly common, whereas the skeletons and bones of backboned animals are rare, especially dinosaurs. So I, I don't think that the claim that dinosaur fossils um, are common, certainly some are more common than others, but when it comes right down to it, um, you know, we need those data, and um, even a single tooth or toe bone can contribute to our knowledge of past life and benefit education in that way. Okay, Peter, now I'd like to hear from you. Okay, <laughs> sorry <laughs> I interrupted there. Um, That's all right. <laughs> so, it's important to remember that, as Tom mentioned, there are 2,000 members of the Society of Rotary Paleontology. That includes students, that includes amateurs, that includes people who, who just love dinosaurs. Uh, there are less than a hundred paleontologists, vertebrate paleontologists in this country who do active collecting. Less than a hundred. There are, I can't, I don't remember the exact statistics, but how many acres of public land, how many acres of private land that are in this country that, that don't get looked at, that have never been looked at, or that, yeah, and, and these fossils are weathering out all the time. The more fossils, a fossil collected is a fossil where some information has been saved. We want to tell people how to do it the right way so they save the information. That uh, The, the uh, con contextual information for these fossils is exceedingly important. But at least some of these fossils are being saved. I don't, you know, I'm not talking about poached fossils, I'm talking about legally collected fossils. Those fossils are saved. If they end up on a mantelpiece and, 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 and a little child reaches up to grab that fossil because it's so interested in it and it falls down on the, uh, on the cement and smashes, it's still better than it washing down to the ocean and nobody's seeing it at all. There's still something that to be gained, something to be gained. And again, when I, I point out how scientifically illiterate people are and when it comes to evolution and, 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 uh, and the age of the earth and geology in this country, and, and whatever we can do to encourage that is going to help to 
uh, for people to have a better understanding of science and how important it is. And yes, vertebrate paleontology, to those of us who are vertebrate paleontologists, believe it's very important in understanding, understanding the Earth. But I think one of the most important uh, important aspects of our science is what it does to kids. And if they can see a fossil and get interested and start asking questions, and then, you know, maybe they're not going to be a paleontologist, but maybe they're going to be somebody who, who cures cancer because they got interested in science and started, uh, started, started that as a child. And that's where fossils in private homes have a place, and, it's, and, 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 and if somebody's spending a lot of money for that fossil, it's not going to be thrown away when, when, it, uh, when that person passes or whatever. It's going to go to a museum, too. You know, it, they'll end up in museums. They may not have as much contextual information as they should at, at times, but sometimes they do. Many of the collectors really want to save that information as well. So, Thomas, do you want to say anything there? Or not? Yeah, I just think that the, the assumption that people need to possess an object in order to appreciate science or nature um, really, you know, it, it kind of doesn't wash. Uh, see, at the end of the day, when fossils are sold to private individuals, it represents a loss of data, especially when it comes to specimens like, you know, the dueling dinosaurs or any of the other dinosaur skeletons that were up for auction in November. But there is, uh, so that raises the issue of, of legal protections for fossils. And um, one of those issues is should the American government protect all significant fossils for scientific research? And I'd say public education as well. So the reason why every fossil is important is that each new one is a test of what we think we already know. And uh, they put a new twist on how we see dinosaurs. No, before, a month ago, we didn't know that duckbill dinosaurs had a fleshy crest on their heads. Completely changed our view of the biology of those animals. So protection of fossils is an important issue. That is protection from sale to private individuals. The United States, curiously, is one of the few countries in the world that does not protect its natural heritage on all of its lands. And as we've pointed out, important fossils on public and private lands do have legal protection, for example, in places such as Mongolia, Italy, and as you mentioned, half the provinces in Canada. These laws do not take away a landowner's fundamental rights. And in the U.S., there are laws in place that do protect fossils on public lands, as we've discussed, and perhaps these could be extended to private land without affecting a landowner's rights at all. So fossils and the benefits that they have for education and research do need protection from private collectors, no matter where they're found. My, uh, Tom, I think you forget things like the dueling dinosaurs would have never been found. Would have never been found. Period. It was the, because a private collector and, and a rancher uh, who needed money the, started to look for fossils on the ranch. They had never let, never let. Uh, uh, they were actually asked to have a. a someone else come on to this particular ranch and they were worried about it because of some of the things that was hap were happening with the federal government and the laws that the federal government was trying to, trying to do. They were worried that there were going to be a whole horde of people come on and ruin their ranch. And so that would never have been found. Had we not found Sue, had we not collected Sue, to, uh, she would have never been found, ever. And, and, and right now, half of that skull, the front half with the teeth in that you love so much, would have been gone would have been gone. Commercial collecting serves a purpose. It saves fossils that would have been lost. They would have been lost. You yeah, cannot issues. collect all the fossils that are weathering out every year, Tom. I wish you could. I wish you could, but you can't. And, and all of us paleontologists together, we can't do it. We need amateurs. We need commercial people. We need to work together, not be mad at each other or try to take rights away from people. Believe me, you take the rights of private ownership away on, on the fossils that are on their land, then they take the rights of private ownership of, for, for the oil and gas and all of this. You, and there's good reasons why you should do that for, quote, the common good. But quite, and, and I'm a Democrat, okay? I'm, I'm a liberal. But, but, but I'm not, I am not in support of taking rights away from private people. And that is taking a right away, no matter what you think. It's taking potential money away from them. It's taking the pleasure that they have of looking for fossils on their own. Uh, it's it's taking something away from them. I think that, you know, I, I'm not in favor of taking anyone's rights away as well, and those effects, I think, are largely speculative. But, I mean, honestly, how how is there any way of justifying the sale of scientifically important specimens 
to a private individual. How do you just how do we how is that justified? More people see them. More people touch them. Museums are kind are cool, but you can't go in and 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 look through a pile of uh, of ammonites. You can't go in and look through a pile of shark's teeth at a at, at a museum. You can't do it. Uh, you can't have that 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 uh, inspiration. But if you're a little kid going out looking for your own fossils on a ranch someplace or something like this, you can have that. You can see that that there's a there's a shark living here in uh, in and uh, you know unless you believe in Noah's flood or something like that, you got to think something's really wrong finding a shark in the middle of the in the middle of the country. And so you start wondering about the geology and how things change and all of this. But it's it's. It's important to have that. And there, there are literally millions, millions of vertebrate fossils that are destroyed each year by weathering. The, the stuff that is, those fossils that are sitting in somebody's mantelpiece are fossils that have been collected that would not have been collected otherwise, almost without, almost without exception, because we all collect in different places. You collect on public lands, we collect on private lands. So, Peter, let me ask you a question that came from, the, uh, from our, one of our chat participants. <clears throat> And it gets back to something you said before, and let me also um, briefly talk about Sue, which we have not introduced to our, our chat participants. Sue is a dinosaur that you uncovered, right, Peter? Um, yep. Back in 1990, 1991, it's a very complete T-Rex, and it went for a record price of over $8 million, is my understanding, at an auction. And it was bought by the Field Museum, and where you can now go see it at the Field Museum of Natural History. So the question that I have for you from, a, uh, from our chat participant is, you mentioned that you had that your Black Hills Institute had dug up a number of dinosaurs. How many had you said, or how many T. Rexes? We've uh, dug what I consider to be, for me, scientifically significant. Might be different for Tom. Ten specimens. Uh, four of those uh, are, are mounted in museums today. And what happened to the other six? They're they're in. Uh, uh, one of them is is at a museum being 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 uh, being worked on. Uh, the other ones are here at the institute. Uh, they're in our, our research collections, and Tom is uh, Tom uh, can tell you that we have big research collections here at the institute as well, in which he is, has has done a lot of research in too. Absolutely. And, and have you um, dug up any dinosaurs that have gone to private collectors? We have uh, we have sold some uh, isolated bones and things that uh, uh, to private collectors. We've but. Uh, yeah, we've sold not not a complete dinosaur skeleton, no, but most people don't have room for a T. Rex skeleton in their living room. Right, right. But dinosaur teeth and those kinds of things you have sold, okay? Certainly, ones that we ones we consider to to be okay to sell. And so our judgment, not someone else's. That's right. And so that's your judgment of what's basically scientifically significant. Is that what you're saying? That's that's correct. Okay. And if I can just sort of flesh Go this ahead. out a bit. <clears throat> If I could flesh this out a bit, when I'm out collecting with my students and volunteers, we collect everything for collections. So we don't leave anything behind. We're very thorough with what we collect because we know we're sampling um, an ancient ecosystem and every bit of data are, are important. Okay. All right. Let me... Um Let's go back to something else, because obviously you guys have disagreements uh, on various issues. At the same time, I both, I, I, there are some things that I think you both agree on. One is that, you know, the importance of fossils for education. Um, and I'm wondering, you obviously all, both also agree that, say, something like the Doing Dinosaur should go to a museum. But how can we get to a place where that is more likely to happen? I th education again. Education. We, we have to... We, people have to realize how important these fossils are. Actually, having a price tag on a fossil is something people can understand. It actually can help them understand how valuable it is. Uh, okay, if, so let me stop right there. If we think our things are worthless, if we think the things we collect don't have value, if they're worthless, then how do we expect the public to understand that they have value? Okay, Tom, would you want to comment on that? Price well, tags on fossils, what does that mean? It means that dinosaurs are a commodity and they're a thing that can be bought and sold like like anything else. And it, it gives the message that, and it has given the message, that people can make a quick buck from selling fossils. And as I mentioned before, the situation's out of control. And it's not just here, it's around the world. And so I think that uh, it's a very dangerous precedent to set. Um, there are... There are 
places in the world where um, the people who, let's say landowners, may get a nominal fee um, for fossils on their land. There, there's some minor exchange, but it's not at these, at these prices, like seven million years, uh, seven million dollars, you know, which could, you know, fund 70 years of field research. I mean, the prices are absolutely unrealistic, and I do, I do think they send the wrong message to the general public. And so we'll see and continue to see, as we are now, fossils being lost from science um, because you know science doesn't you know our pockets aren't that deep and the prices are are incredibly inflated uh, just to give you an example um, I'm sure that the dueling dinosaurs were probably excavated over a couple of months or something like that to put that into perspective uh, the field expeditions that I lead each year uh, minus salaries cost no more than uh, $12,000 and the bulk of that is the rental cars so when you go from a $12,000 field season to a $7 million dinosaur that's a hell of a markup $12,000 minus minus salaries you said minus salaries yeah minus salaries which, um, well, which put your salaries into we have to get we have a salary too but we figured that into our cost right well with salaries <laughs> it's less than 15 a field season. You only get, you only get, you, you get $3,000 a year? Um, well, that's what we you have, have to do. You have only one field, field season. season. But the, the point is, is that, the, is that the prices on these fossils are completely unrealistic, and they send the wrong message. I they're, mean, they're, they're completely arbitrary. And the real value, the true value, is the scientific data. They're not arbitrary. They're market value. They're what a willing buyer and a willing seller. Uh, that's 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 the market. The market decides what the value is. If, but if that can change over it, time, correct? That might does. change over time. It does. You know, uh, Sue selling for eight point three six million dollars today might not happen for that much. And 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 uh, you know the arbitrary. Uh, that's where I mean I don't like auctions, but but that's where an auction as uh, uh, they when we were talking about Sue, that's where the auction decided what she was worth. And quite frankly, Sue was even the reason Sue went to auction was in part. Uh, due to the SVP's involvement in that, and their their condoning of what the U.S. Attorney did, and she ended up being sold for auction. So, you know, the SVP is as, as much to blame as anybody for the price of fossils. Tom, do you have a response to that one? Well, I just think at at the end of the day, uh, the sale of uh, important scientifically important specimens. Um, uh, uh, basically um, is setting as set a very destructive precedent and people are collecting fossils for money um, and uh, really high prices that's relatively historically recent and the science is is in crisis I think this is the lowest point the science has ever been in terms of, of specimens being threatened uh, by the sale to uh, private interests and just losing that information I mean we're we see it so frequently now. I can't help but think, I wish that we could, there'd be some way to focus on the areas of agreement you guys have. Um, and, and I said this not just for this chat, but sort of for the field as a whole, because it seems like you both respect the scientific information that can come from fossils, although, uh, you know, Pete, you also respect the dollar value, and Tom feels that the science really needs to trump that. I wonder if there's any way to um, encourage more collegial things. Now, you said, Tom, you've actually gone and studied fossils at, his, at, at Pete's place. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's an it's a open collection. Uh, myself and other colleagues have studied specimens there. The uh, Black Hills have been very open with their collection, and, and they've been a, it's a, been a very scientifically important collection. So they've made it publicly available. And I think that's the exception and, and not the rule. We, we also protect it. I mean, it's protected yeah. through, through resolutions and things. And I think we can, I think Tom and I agree on one really, really important thing, and that is that scientifically s significant specimens should be in museums. They should be in museums where they're available to the public. But I think scientists have a responsibility to, to, to as well as commercial people and as well as amateurs, to get together to work to try to make this happen in the best possible way, and and so I th and, and I th would you agree with that, Tom? 
yeah. Um, I, guess I was just wondering, uh, just out of curiosity, um, with regard to the Julian dinosaurs, how was it that, fi that the five and a half million offer wasn't enough? The uh, uh, it, it what it didn't meet the reserve and and in 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 there's something that I I, I really can't say online, but I can tell you privately about that. Okay. But, All right. I think, guys, that we're going to wrap up this chat at this point, but I want to thank you both so much for your time. Um, again, what, uh, what I've taken from this is that you have some areas of agreement and some areas of disagreement, and I, and I hope for the state of American paleontology that uh, we can find a way to move forward. Thank you again. I want to mention to all our viewers that this chat will be archived, so you can come back and look for it later. Um, next week's chat will be on January 30. It's on raw human data, data in biomedicine. So please tune in for that if you're interested. And thank you again both so much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you. Bye. Thank you. We also agree that we both love tyrannosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.